I wanted to talk a little bit today about how this must be stronger than that. And I'm going to explain what that means here in just a moment. I talked about this at the beginning of this year. Uh, Every year we'll take some time and talk about some vision for this coming year, what our team senses from the Spirit and what God's doing in our community. And it was this focus that our faith must be stronger than our doubt. Our hope must be stronger than our despair, and our love must be stronger than any form of hate. And I just felt like during this fall time where a lot of people regather as the church, you know, you're kind of back from summer vacations, the the chaos if you have kids of kids being out of school and all the different challenges to your schedule that that creates, um, and many people come back, and I was like, this feels like the right time to just revisit that vision of what it means for our faith, hope, and love to be stronger than kind of the organizational structure that the world throws at us day in and day out, whether it's at your work, with your friends and community, wherever it is you may find yourself, that there is an organizational structure that's not set up to support the thriving of your faith, hope, and love in Jesus. And how do we navigate that? How do we navigate that tension that we live in a space where our faith and hope and love is contested on the daily? And for some of us, that may be kind of a new experience. Maybe you, you moved to Sacramento from a different part of the country where your faith was less contested. Uh, maybe you're not from California originally, and you're moving to California, or you're settling in here, and you're like, man, it, my faith feels more contested here than it has in the past. Or maybe just from this past season, this past couple of years, where it's been so challenging to navigate, how do we live out our faith in a meaningful way? How do we even remain a faithful person who follows Jesus in the cultural context we find ourselves in? It's been so challenging. But I want to give and hopefully paint a picture of what that could look like for us as a faith community. Um, John Tyson wrote a book called Beautiful Resistance. And in that, in his introduction, he reflects on the, the life and ministry of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And I wanted to read just a portion of this because I think it gives a really great illustration of how this, our faith, hope, and love together in community must be stronger than that. And he, he describes a, a set of circumstances that fortunately we're not living in today, but there are definitely some contest, very real contested spaces we still need to learn to navigate well through. Here's what he wrote. In 1935, Dietrich Bonhoeffer began to develop an underground seminary that would match orthodox belief and the practice of the Christian faith. He did this amidst the Nazi reign of terror in Germany. And as most churches became apostate by adopting the Nazi ideologies, discipleship must be stronger than cultural formation. Loyalty must be stronger than compromise. Our love must be stronger than death. This must be stronger than that. The times called for a beautiful resistance. Such a prophetic stance was in some ways laughable. Bonhoeffer's seminary was small and its season was short. The Gestapo would close the seminary in 1937, just two years later. And in many ways, it was a feeble joke compared with the power of the Third Reich. But it was a prophetic seed of a faithful church. And over time, as Jesus promised, the small seed grew and bore fruit. Today, the Reich is a shameful memory. Hitler is in the grave, and the German church is repentant. But the fruit of Finkenwald, which was the name of his seminary, the community, the vision, and the work has gone on to shape a a vision of Christian discipleship that has inspired millions. Bonhoeffer was right. This must be stronger than that, and it was. Should we just give up? Tyson writes, should we just give up and, and capitulate to the powers of our time? Should we sit by while our faith is taken captive by political 
and ideological forces? Should we avert our eyes while money and materialism wreaks havoc on our hearts? Should we watch 20 million young people leave the church in our generation? A million a year give up on their faith. Is it possible to build community in such a way that though it is small, generations to come will look back on our faithfulness in a generation of compromise? The new resistance Tyson writes, I believe that what was true in the 1930s is true now. We live in a time where the church is compromising with culture left, right, and center, and we are losing our influence. Though there is no specific Hitler pressuring us, we face a myriad of forces seeking to sabotage our faith because of the tectonic shift in sexuality, ethics, technology, secular ideologies, religion, and globalization. Much of the familiar landscape has been swept away. And in many areas, our culture is almost unrecognizable compared with just a generation ago. The spiritual devastation from much of this cultural change and the failure of the church to respond well have been almost unthinkable. So, we must call our generation to loyalty to Christ. Some have called it fidelity to Christ. We must live with devotion and conviction regardless of what they cost us. This must be stronger than that. Now, if you know Bonhoeffer's story, he ends up giving his life because of the faith and the beautiful resistance that he stood for contending for fidelity to Christ admits horrible compromise of the church in Nazi Germany. So how do we carry on that tradition of a faith that holds a beautiful resistance that we could look back in history and be like, there is the faithful remnant. There are the people who held to orthodoxy, who, who contended to be a, a people of faith, hope, and love, even amidst much contention. And I know that that's no small task to encourage us towards. But the church is always one generation away from no longer existing. And if you look around this room, it's full of many different young people. And that brings me a lot of hope. That there's people who are still willing to gather, to spend time, to invest into what it might mean, what it might look like to do the things we're talking about here. The Apostle Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. These are known as the three theological virtues. Some uh, scholars and commentators call them the three divine sisters. I like that uh, uh, kind of picture of faith, hope, and love, these divine sisters that kind of help us to get a vision for what our faith, hope, and love could look like, that there's this intersection and that, that we're to contend for and live into. And if we're to think of what a faith stronger than doubt could look like, how a hope stronger than despair could transform us in the community and families that we're a part of, how a love stronger than any form of hate could be a faithful witness to this world that may create Christianity as a beautiful thing again for people to consider. So I want to look at first, formed by a faith stronger than doubt. Faith stronger than doubt. You know, uh, deconstruction, it's a movement, it's real, uh, how many of you have ever heard of that before? Deconstruction, pretty much, yeah, everyone in the room. They've done a great job. And they, as in people who are wanting to apply critical theory to ancient spiritual theological truths that have been passed down uh, to us for, for two millennia plus, okay? Um, deconstruction, in my opinion, is clickbait. <laughs> it's clickbait for millennials and Gen Zers right now for encouraging us to tear apart a historic, thoughtful organization for good that won't fight back, also known as the church. And this rally cry of, yes, let's do it. 
seems to be the cry of many angsty teenagers and midlife crisis exvangelicals, okay? And I just want to encourage us to, to kind of slow the roll. If maybe you've taken that path, just to slow your roll a bit, to engage in a patient, thoughtful, open to other views and opinions beyond just the Instagram influencer that you know also has a YouTube page that all of a sudden somehow knows all the answers but has never really spent the time to look at historic Orthodox Christianity, right? To just slow our roll and consider more broadly and more widely. Tearing apart the foundational settings of our life is typically not a good idea unless it's absolutely necessary. The foundational settings of your life. Think about what are those foundational settings of your life. To just tear them apart in kind of a, an, an angstful rage, kind of against the machine moment, right? Typically does not pan out well in the long term in adult adulting in life. Same goes with our faith. And as the church, you know, as the church can be for everything that God is for, how how could we consider what our faith means and how it comes to bear upon this moment where there's partisan politics and political lines that if you don't walk that political line, you get canceled. You get canceled by the people that maybe, you know, you've kind of formed affinity with and similarity with. That's part of how we form community. Cultural stereotypes and media algorithms that are forming our views more than ancient scriptures that have existed far beyond this cultural moment and nation. Are we open to allow the spirit of Christ, these ancient stories of the scriptures and the counsel of the faithful saints? I know that there's been unfaithful saints throughout church history, but there's been some really beautiful and good ones as well. Are we gonna allow that counsel to shape our present day and guide us in how we engage in our faith? In Genesis 2 and 3, we read an ancient origin story of humanity, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. This origin story has stood the test of time and provides deep theological clarity and vision for our world as it is. We read here the first question ever recorded from the crafty serpent described in Genesis 3.1, speaking to Eve, saying, did God really say, did God really say you must not eat of any tree in the garden? We have to consider what did God really say? God didn't say that. God said, you cannot eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything else you can eat from. Eve tried her best to repeat what had been told her by Adam, but she had not remembered. And apparently, neither did Adam, because he didn't correct her her misguided requote. Do we know what God has said? Do we still believe what God has spoken. And if not, we need to come to him and ask him to clarify for us. You know, there's there's a a spoken rule in our home. And I have three boys, if you didn't know that. I have a 14, 11, and 8-year-old. And you can only imagine that there are many moments. There was one this morning where there's conflict that happens. There's misunderstanding There's like this struggle to communicate wants and needs and desires and then to be listened to, heard, and responded to, right? This sounds like our own, you know, human experience as well at times. But there's this spoken rule of like, hey, I want you guys to learn to work things out. So I will let some conflict fly. I let it fly this morning in our home. There was an argument about trading Pokemon cards, and it was happening, and I heard it, and I was brushing my teeth, and I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it fly and see if they can work it out, see if they can talk through it. And they did a little bit, <laughs> which I'm like, 
That's a win. They're learning. Like, that's really important. Uh, they didn't cancel each other. <laughs> I was like, this is a win. There's, there's like good things happening here. And, and then Moses asked for help, which is the other rule. Like, if you can't work it out, ask for help. I'm here to help. I'm here to help guide, help create healthy communication, help work through conflict. Like, I want to contend for you guys to be loving brothers into adulthood. Like, I want that for you. And the only way I can do that is to model and to intervene when appropriate and necessary. And how many of you know we have a good, godly parent? That the Spirit of Christ dwells within us and is there to help us, to remind us of everything Jesus did, said, and taught, to be a wonderful counselor, to be a God who can intervene and help us work through conflict and misunderstanding. See, Adam, in the story of Adam and Eve, clearly didn't know or remember what God had really said because he was supposed to be the one that told Eve, and Eve didn't know what God had really said. Do we know what God has said and spoken? Paul does a great job in helping us understand how our faith grows, and he says in Romans 10, 17, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. As we come to terms with who Jesus is, what the scriptures describe him as, his closest followers and friends said things like, this was the word made flesh, God incarnate, come to dwell, to set up his tabernacle among us through this person of Jesus. These are people who walked with him every day for three years and said that. Like, if someone walked with me every day for three years, that would not be what they're saying about me. And certainly wouldn't be willing to die for it at the end of their life. (laughs) They'd be like, yeah, he was just, you know, Tim. (laughs) But Jesus and the testimony we have about him and what his closest followers and friends witnessed about him and were witnesses even to the point of death. Peter, his closest disciple at the end of his life, is being crucified for his faith. He says, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same way as my Lord. Turn it upside down. I'll be crucified upside down. That is an incredible witness to consider. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with endurance the race set out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author. Other translations say the pioneer, founder, and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning, laughing at its shame. And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. This is how our faith grows. And it may seem silly and overly simplified. And the apostle Paul, towards the end of his ministry, he he would say things like, you know, I don't come to you with fanciful words. I come to you in the simplicity of the gospel, claiming all I know is Jesus and him crucified. That is the story. That is the whole foundation of what it is we're about as the church of Christ. How can we fix our eyes, fix our mind, fix our heart upon that story and allow it to restory who we are becoming? That we are never meant to be Our story was never meant to be defined by what has been done to us, but what has has been done for us in Christ. Think about the identity-shaping power of the story of Jesus. That is radically transformational. It has the potential to be, at least. So how do we engage in that? What are some practical things? Here's a couple ideas. One is that we have a recommended rhythm of life. I've been at this thing called Society Church for 10 plus years now, and I've seen a lot of people come through this faith community, through our city, and if 
people are not willing to embrace and engage some form of recommended rhythm of life that's described here, it just doesn't work. The culture is too thick here in Sacramento, California to your, for your faith to survive. So recommended rhythm creates a trellis, if you will, for you to be able to grow in, in your faith and to become fruitful in following Christ. There are four rhythms that we recommend. One is life together. You're doing that this morning. You're sharing in life together. And we do that through community groups, through all the different offerings we have throughout the week, through different prayer practices that we're going to be engaging in, through Sabbath, that you're a human being, not a human doing. You need to learn to stop working, delight in your life, and rest in God. And daily office, to be able to have a daily time to recenter our hearts and minds upon Christ and what that could look like. We have all kinds of resources for that for you. And then uh, lastly, living a spirit-led life, that the goal of practices and spiritual disciplines is so that we can integrate our spirituality throughout all of life that all of a sudden everything becomes a spiritual practice. That's the goal, right? So we want to kind of undo any form of legalism with recommended rhythms and practices and just say the ultimate goal is that you're following Jesus in everything you're doing. And all of a sudden you're seeing the spirit at work at your workplace, in your family, in your relationships, in your conversations, and how you show up in the world. That's the goal, right? Um. I think a big part of this as well, consume more helpful content centered around the story of Jesus. Um, You know, I've seen the statistics. Uh, Most of you, those statistics would say most of you in this room are consuming way more content that has nothing to do about Jesus and is probably actually opposed to the worldview of what Jesus stood for than uh, the, the alternative. That is ultimately what's discipling you. That's what's shaping how we think about what we think about. That's what's shaping how we're showing up in the world. And the church has no chance. Like an hour on Sunday morning has has like no chance against that. Like this must be stronger than that. And the only way that that happens is that we begin to change what it is we're consuming. Because ultimately that determines the trajectory, the telos of who we're becoming. Uh, Here's some recommended resources. If you're struggling with doubt, here's some recommended reads. There are some unrecommended reads, lots of them out there floating around. These are recommended reads, okay? Uh, After Doubt by A.J. Swoboda is a great read, super helpful. Uh, When Everything is on Fire, (laughs) compelling title, yes. Uh, This is by Brian Zand, great read. Searching for Enough, this is by Tyler Staten. Uh, And then When Faith Fails by Dominic Doan. Four great recommended resources. If you're like, man, I probably need to read one of those because I'm struggling, uh, let me know. I can give those resources to you as well. Formed by a faith stronger than doubt. Second, moved by a hope stronger than despair. Moved by a hope stronger than despair. Having faith and hope together in community holds a sustainable strength that we will need for the journey. Uh, I want to provide a brief explanation of our despair and a reason for hope in Christ. Uh, A lot of these words are not my own. They're uh, kind of taught to me from different people. Um, Some of those being Leslie Newbegin, Charles Taylor, Francis Schaeffer, Tim Keller, and it's just kind of a mashup from reading some of those influences and just kind of sharing with you some observations. So the Western secular worldview developed during the Enlightenment in the 1750s to 1900s is one of the first cultural ideologies that believes that our science... Knowledge and technology that as that increases, our lives will get better and stronger over time. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. Life and the world are not getting better and stronger. You might be like, what? We live way longer than we used to. How is that quality of life going? In fact, the premise of this idea is set up against one of the foundational principles of science itself. 
Second law of thermodynamics, that things are progressively wearing out, breaking down, and destroying themselves. As we create and use, that things are getting worn out. The fuel of our existence is continually going down. For example, global pandemics happen because of, most people would say, globalization. The ease and availability and affordability of travel and technology ultimately are to blame. Climate change, the cost for developing our stuff, our transportation, our industries and technology is eroding our climate. Some may disagree with that. That's fine. You can disagree with it. You're still welcome here. Uh, misinformation as a result of the information age brought about by technology and social networks. Fake news can spread just as fast as the real stuff. Suicide, anxiety, and depression rates are astronomical because we're more alone, more glued to our devices, entertainment, individualism, and our stuff than any other time in all of history. People are not starting or raising families. Some experts have called this an effect of hopelessness. Why would I ever want to raise a child in such a world as this? The secular idea of progress that as knowledge, tech, and access increases, life would get better assumes that people will use that knowledge, tech, and access properly. It assumes the goodness of human nature. Social inequality, pandemics, and the ability to destroy each other with technology did not happen in spite of our increased knowledge, but rather because of it. Increased knowledge is not creating the progress we have ultimately desired. In short, the secular hope for history isn't working. The secular idea of progress says that humans will use their knowledge for good and that inside us we have everything we need, that all our problems are outside of us, caused by something other, the other, those people that aren't really people or at least don't seem to act like it, those family, social, ethnic, cultural, and or economic systems and structures that have oppressed me, this idolatry, Ideology breaks down so quickly, it becomes a blame game that never, that never gets solved. Who is to blame? Not me. It's not my fault. There's no way to deal with guilt and shame. No one can successfully take ownership of mistakes because they have not been taught how to deal with shame, deal with guilt. There's been no pathway given of how to repent well. No one can take personal ownership and experience transformation in this type of society. And just to be clear, I am not saying that unjust oppression of people and people groups hasn't happened. I am not saying that. I am also not saying that we are to ignore or forget the very real realities of oppression. We need to learn from these current and historical realities, repent of the mistakes and wrong thinking that caused them, and then make the personal and systemic changes necessary to treat all people with dignity, equity, and kindness as good disciples of Jesus, even when our culture is unwilling to do so to be a people who both pray and live in accordance with the Lord's prayer, that your kingdom would come, O oh God. Your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven and have that come to bear in and through our lives and in our world. But the teachings of Jesus in the scriptures tell us that the genesis of our problem is inside us. And that is where everything wrong with the world flows from. We are responsible I am responsible. You are responsible. We are responsible. But in Christ, there is forgiveness and hope for our lives to embody good news for our world. If all this, the planet Earth, our solar system, human nature, and the unique and specific underpinnings that make our existence possible are all a cosmic evolutionary accident without any other personal presence behind, admits, or beyond it, there is no reason for hope in this world. 
One day it will just all putter out and die or something worse. And it will all be without any purpose or lasting significance. So nothing matters. This is what some call ultimate oblivion. The outworking of that line of thought quickly becomes, so do what you want, when you want, how you want, you do you. What does that idea about the purpose of life produce? What has it produced for this generation? My observation in myself as that culture and influence and tension and contended space comes to bear upon me and as I've seen it come to bear upon many others, it creates a very narcissistic, self-focused, lazy, hopeless people. Is that how we want to end up living? Is that the stamp we want on this generation of faith? Not me. Jesus offers us a reasonable hope, a good end of human history, not ultimate oblivion. All things made new through Christ, in Christ, for all things that exist. This is the imminent return we hope for. Jesus coming and finishing the job that we could not complete on our own effort, science, tech, and progress. That just seems to be pushing the envelope forward a little bit more and creating a bit more suffering in the world than ultimately we we want to experience. And it creates this tension and contention within us that says, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Every religion offers an alternative to this thing called ultimate oblivion. The Western culture is the first culture that does not offer an alternative to this. Christianity believes that at the end of time, all things will be made new in Christ. Not a disembodied heaven, but the life we had always hoped for will be brought into reality once and for all. That's good news. That creates hope in me. Like, I have something to look forward to, even on my worst day. Like, good's coming. It may not even come in this life, but I know that good's coming. And I I can contend for that in the power of the Spirit because I know that that is the will of God that I'm seeking to bring into my life and my family, my relationships, and my world. And I know that God's power is at work as I contend with God to bring that good to bear upon the world. And even when it doesn't work, even when the contended space is stronger, I still have hope. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagle. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Hope can see the bigger picture. It can rise above the circumstances of the everyday. Hope has fresh legs, a renewed strength for a new race to run. Hope holds a renewal of new vision. There's so many reasons for despair in our world and our personal realities. And there are temptations towards despair. I know my own, as I look at Sacramento, as I look at our church, as I look at the school options for my kids in Sacramento, like there are reasons for despair, but there is a hope that is greater. And that hope is something I have to hold on to just to survive. I want to possess a hope-fueled imagination of what could be not a despair based upon the reality of just what is. What a sad state to live in without imagination to consider what could be and how our faith could help to create that and contend for that. I want to be realistic, but I also want to be hope-fueled, faith-filled, imaginative, and a creative follower of Jesus. I think that's what people are looking for. Will the faith that we claim to possess create that in us for the sake of others? Not just trusting my own abilities, which if I'm honest are few, my own work ethic and grit, but learning to bet on the grace of God, working in and multiplying through my life. 
as I actively live into my faith for the benefit and sake of others. We need the hope of Christ to be able to do this. So how do we do this? What are some practical ways that our hope can be stronger than the temptation towards despair in our world? Um, The only way that I know how to hold on to this is through prayer. Constant, as much as I can, conversation with God. That begins to lift me up out of those circumstances so I can see what God is up to and doing. I can have spiritual eyes to see, spiritual ears to hear the whisper of God's spirit directing my life. And some of you may think, Tim, I think you're crazy. Join the club. Like, there is a large club of people that think I'm crazy. Uh, And uh, they'll welcome you, I'm sure, with open arms. But I'm going to stay crazy because I don't know any other way. I don't know any other way. I need the comfort and grace of God. I need the, the gentle whispers of God saying, I see you, I love you. I'm with you. I'm for you. You can do this. In me, you can do all things as I'm beginning to give you greater strength and build on that. So I'm leading a prayer group for this very reason during community groups this session. Uh, my, I know my wife Vanessa is leading a prayer of examine group as well. We have pre-service prayer that happens every Sunday. We'd love to have you join us in. Community groups are centered around creating space for prayer. If a community group is not praying, I'm like, what are we doing? <laughs> um, we need to be a people that are centered in conversation and relationship with God. Prayer is the biggest piece of how to hold on to that hope. Last point as we finish up this morning. To be a people captured by a love stronger than death and any form of hate. Martin Luther King Jr. in his book Strength to Love, written in 1963, classic quote, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. The ultimate end of hate, according to a Christological worldview, is death. In the end of human history, hate will be put to death once and for all. That's what I believe in Christ. Love will win the day into all of eternity. All things will be made new in the person of Jesus Christ, love incarnate, the living proof of God's love for the world. The greatest of these, of faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these, the Apostle Paul wrote, is love. That's why we have lit up on neon as you walk through our doors, to be a living expression of our loving God for Sacramento. Sin in its simplest definition is hate. Sometimes hate is unintentional and springs from ignorance in us. Sometimes it is very intentional and springs from rage. Hate towards God, the very author and presence of love, and hate towards ourselves and or others, ones in whom God dearly loves. Hate happens. Sin produces and perpetuates a hate for God, a hate for self, a hate towards others. Hate's ultimate end is death. It's what causes our death, the death of our current world as we know it and our own spiritual life. And the only antidote for the perpetuation of hate in the world is love. But even more specific, I want to get more specific, and there's lots of different angles you could take on, well, what is love? And how do we express that? How do we live into that? Here's a really important one that I want us to get, which is forgiveness. Forgiveness is the reactive, creative agent in the heart of God that produces a regeneration of love within the human heart. Here's it said more simply. When we experience the forgiveness of God, it makes us love God more, which in turn creates a heart of love for everyone around us. I don't know any other creative, reactive agent that produces that. Forgiveness from God for our intentional and unintentional God hate, self-hate and others' hate, is only made possible through Christ. 
Ezekiel 36, 26 says, and I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you and I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender and responsive heart. Yeah, I, I remember a lot of wonderful and difficult conversations I had in my 20s with my parents. And I'm so grateful that my parents are also a part of this faith community. But my bio mom and dad, <laughs> I have amazing and wonderful stepmom and a stepdad. And I, I am blessed to be able to have three sets of parents, uh, my in-laws included in that. And But sorting through divorce and, you know, the challenge of kind of family being torn apart and, and navigating that in my early 20s and in my teenage years, I was not a very kind son. And, and I was not a very open and responsive Jesus follower. I was working through forgiveness and how important that is. And I remember meeting Jesus in my adult, more adult years at 19. And Jesus beginning to just forgive me and, and begin to melt my heart and give me a tender and responsive heart towards what God was wanting to do in my life. And I remember some wonderful conversations, tear-filled conversations with my parents during those years. And it created so much um, joy and reconciliation within my family. And, and that's really hard to do, but so important for us to contend for. Forgiveness is the cure to hate. Forgiveness is the human soul's immunity that allows us to remain possessed with the love of God for ourselves and others in a way that can infectiously transform our relationships, our families, our neighborhoods, cities, and world. So I want to just talk about forgiveness for just a couple of minutes as we land the plane here this morning. Forgiveness is a choice to extend love instead of withholding it. Even when it may be withheld for specific reasons, to extend mercy, a withholding of judgment and a giving of forgiveness. You know, withholding closeness and affection for specific reasons can be a way of loving ourselves at times. Boundaried love for others for the sake of loving ourselves can be the most loving thing we can do at times. Boundaried love is meant to protect someone from real danger, from people trying to do them harm. However, boundaried love out of unforgiveness and bitterness is just as potentially hurtful as the one who has wronged us. Being offended by what someone said or how they said that, in my mind, is not a justified reason for boundaryed love. It is, however, a great reason to engage in clarifying, courageous conversations. This goes in direct contrast to cancel culture. And cancel culture is not Christianity. You know, half of the church of society church in 2020 canceled society church for an assortment of reasons. And I'm like, I failed at discipling this church. I don't want to do that again. Like, let's have the courageous, confrontive, clarifying conversations. I'm going to contend for that. Like, I send emails to people, and now I send follow-up emails to people. Like, did you get this email? Did you get that text message? Are we going to talk about this, or are we just going to play like everything's okay? I don't have time to play. I got a life to live. I got people to love. I got a, a story of good news to share with people that I care about. Let's contend for that together. Let's do the hard work in contested space where it's easier to just cancel each other out and have those courageous, clarifying, kind-hearted conversations that are really uncomfortable most of the time. You know, like, they're not easy to have. I get it. Like, I have many panic attacks in conversations with people. I have to literally, like, focus on my breathing as I talk to people because I feel attacked. 
And I know they do too at times, but it's like, how can we contend? How can we make peace in space and relationship together? It is our witness to our city. Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples because of your love for one another. It matters deeply. Here's how Hebrews 12 puts it as we finish up. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping heads, strengthen your weak knees, make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the, whole, for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal, for you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. In encouragement, let's be trained in forgiveness to love one another well, not embittered, not easily offended by each other, like thick skin of offense. You know, have you ever been around people that it's like you have to walk on eggshells? It's like, I don't want to. I have to say it that perfect way and I have to show up in this perfect way. It's like, that's exhausting. We as Christians do not want to put that on each other or the world in which we live. Like people should feel free and seen and able to express. Like that's one of the things with our kids as well. We want them to be able to come to us and have conversations. Like we're in, embedding that in like, we can talk about anything. And to make it a non-judgmental, truth-speaking, love-embracing space where discipleship is happening. That's what family is supposed to be about, right? That's also what the family of God is supposed to be about. For us to be able to show up in, in a way that is merciful, that was kind, that's open, that has conversations about hard things. Like, we're contending for that. Will you join us in that? Roots of bitterness cause trouble. They defile, they break down, they destroy community. And it also leads to acts and fruits. Hebrews 12 connects this here for us. Acts and fruits of the sinful nature that destroy community as well and leave regret in his place. It uses the illustration of Esau. Forgiveness is essential to a life of faith, hope, and love. Without it, bitterness grows in its place. When, where there's supposed to be tender-hearted affection for God, ourselves, and others. Here's how Jesus put it, and we'll finish up. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Forgiveness is the catalyst of relationship for us and God and each other. As we finish... What would it look like for our faith to be stronger than our doubts, our hope to be stronger than our despair, and our love to be stronger than any hate? That is the type of church and faith we are contending for. What if this could be stronger than that? I want to close in a time of prayer together. If you want to close your eyes, you're welcome to do that. If you want to open your hands, you're welcome to do that as well. Just a posture of receiving I just want to pray blessing over us. Just take a few deep breaths here. God, thank you that you are with us. You see us, all the different people that have gathered this morning. You know their cir circumstances, their situations, their personalities and temperament, the things that they have contended for, for your kingdom to come to bear upon their world this week. God, you know them, and you love us. You look with delight over us. You call us your beloved. God, 
God, we need your grace to be deeply at work in us. Holy Spirit, fill us with faith, a faith stronger than our doubt. Write a new chapter of faith in our lives, one that builds off the previous chapters, but that is new all the less. Holy Spirit, fill us with hope, hope that is stronger than any kind of despair. Allow us to soar on wings like eagles, see a vision of what you're up to amidst all of the details of our lives, to join you in the vision of your kingdom, making all things new. Grant us new strength for a new season. Holy Spirit, fill us with love. A love stronger than any offense or any form of hate. Forgive us our sins. Allow us the grace to forgive those who have sinned against us. Any bitter root that has grown up in our hearts or lives, we pull out by the authority of Jesus and speak forgiveness and grace and mercy. Make us a kind-hearted, tender-hearted, responsive, compassionate people. And may that love be a witness to those you've placed in our lives. Come by your grace. Make us infectiously possess people of faith, hope, and love for this beloved city and the world in which we live. We pray these things in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.